there was lore about the idea that spirits could inhabit different parts of the body. And of course, many people still have that as part of their faith, and I'm not going to uh, challenge that, but merely describe the lore that goes behind and proceeds with the ideas of modern ritual abuse. I'm going to give you an example that um, relates to something that a patient taught me. Obviously, those of us who are therapists, we've really learned everything about this from the survivors. And, and we have to really be humble about it. The reality is we have not learned anything from graduate school that has to do with this whatsoever. The only thing that we have learned, hopefully, is that, that people have rights and um, people should be treated with respect. But beyond that, uh, most of us that work in this area have learned what we've learned from the survivors. I'd like to describe a, a kind of a case scenario for you. I was working in a local hospital and there was a woman in the hospital who was abreacting. She was abreacting for hours. The nursing staff were very upset about it because she had been in restraints for a long time and they didn't want her to be in restraints but she was so violently out of control they simply did not want, know what to do. The patient at, at one point was in a state of a dragon growling and um, apparently she'd been in that state before. Another one of my patients expressed to me a great deal of concern for this patient and said um, that perhaps there was a way that she could be brought out of the state. And I said, well, do you have any suggestions? Uh, and this other patient told me what to do. And um, I wonder if I have a volunteer. We have a volunteer? Okay. If you'll have a seat right here, uh, if you'll step forward just a little bit. Uh, here's my hand. Okay. And here's the, the chair. Okay. Now, you don't mind if I touch your body? Okay. What I'm going to do is basically just show um, this procedure. First, I'm going to explain it, though. Um, the patient told me that if I did a certain accessing procedure on this other patient that she would come out of the state. Now, normally we don't take advice from other therapists about how to treat, I mean, from other patients about how to treat other patients. But uh, I knew this individual to be quite a reliable person and I had great personal trust in her and I, I was indeed concerned for the patient who was experiencing a lengthy, protracted, uh, abreactive state. So the helpful patient, the patient who was giving me this information said that what I should do is touch the patient very firmly and quickly in the center of the forehead and then bilaterally, those both hands, move down the throat like so from ear down toward the chin and then with the patient's shoes off, massage her feet. Now that sounds kind of strange but we're going to talk about why that works. In fact, I went, this was not my patient, but I went to the nursing staff and I said, I, I may have a way to get this patient out of the abreactive state. And I was on staff there and they knew me and they said, please do something. Because actually nothing could have been worse. If I had done something and the patient got angry, that would not have been worse than the state she was in. So basically I went up to the patient and did the procedure then massage the feet. Well, uh, I was told by the helpful patient that a, a helpful child altar would come out. And that's what happened. So I did the procedure. This patient had been in an abreactive state for hours. And then we had a helpful child come out. Well, I can't see any way that suggestibility could have any possible uh, input in this. Um, the patient who was helping me with this programming sequence 
explained that, that as far as she knew, it was something that would work within a particular part of the country. It might not be something that worked all over. And uh, there were some other occasions where I experienced patients who had protracted abreactions. They were, uh, on another occasion, for example, um, in fact, Pam observed this one. She's not here right now. We were called to the emergency room of a hospital because one of my patients was in the uh, emergency room uh, having labor pains, but she was not pregnant. She was going through some sort of um, mental or psychological labor. Uh, some people talk about false pregnancy, uh, etc. I tell you what, that's, uh, that's a really helpful thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wait till we get to hand signals, and I would ask, I, I would invite anybody who uh, wants to contribute to this because this is what this, this seminar is about, exactly that. But what, I want to kind of finish up here. So to make a long story short, um, basically I've been interested in collecting, uh, well, I should go back to the story. This patient was in the emergency room, and when we arrived, she was going through labor. The nurses didn't know what to do with her. She was in great pain. She was abreacting. I mean, it was a psychological thing. And it was not a physical thing in, in the sense she was not pregnant. So I wondered if this technique might work with her also. She also was from a similar part of the country. So I, I did the procedure with the patient. I asked for permission. I, somewhere in the East Coast. And this patient, I had to do it twice, but she immediately stopped, and she was in a child altar state. Now, the patient who taught me this explained that for the, the programming in that area, that child altars are often located in the feet. So that's why the particular procedure uh, had that particular effect. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Okay. Well, I guess I should really say dissociated mental states because, as I mentioned before, I don't think of the, these really as alters. Um, there's an old lore, and, and uh, it goes back to the idea that we can create... You know, if you go back to the history of occultism, there's a lore that says that we can create life ourselves. We can be gods in the process of becoming a god and creating spirits, which a lot of this is what it's about. Um, in my opinion, not literally, because I'm not, I, I have no supernatural beliefs myself, but some people do. And what I'm arguing is this happens physically, that trauma causes it to happen. But anyway, there, there's an old occult tradition. Uh, it goes along with the idea of creating golems, if some of you are familiar with that, um, a medieval occult uh, concept. I think these really are alter personalities, that in medieval times they knew you could create alter personalities and so they gave them various names. And they could be a familiar, could be an alter personality that you were creating. Now, the, the lore was that they occupied different parts, or demons occupied different parts of the body. So it's my understanding that when, when programming occurs for some individuals, the dissociated states may have a sense. Obviously, they're not located. They're located in the mind, in the brain. But they may have a sense of being located somewhere else in the body. So we're going, going to talk a little bit about body, laterality, loci, and the body map. The idea of the body map is just as important as mapping out alters is for therapists, listing their names and their jobs and their ages and things of that nature. But there are other reasons why the body map is important. Obviously, those of you who are familiar with programming know that the body is mapped out in, in sophisticated programming. Uh, the body is mapped out and different kinds of trauma are um, provided to the body in different areas for different kinds of programming. Okay? You all, I'm sure all of you have heard about that. But there's another point to this that I, I wanted to emphasize. In our di a much simpler one. In our diagnosis of these patients, many times we can make a diagnosis by just talking with the patient about their body a little bit and by examining, not, not medically examining their body, 
but by doing a psychological examination that relates to the way they perceive their body and the way their body feels. For example, I'll give you uh, just a, a brief example. Um, if I had a Bible, which I usually don't have one in my office, but my associate has one, and if I go get it, if I have a Bible, what would happen, let's say if I said, I'd like to talk to you about spirituality. I'm not really a, a um, spiritually oriented therapist, but I know spirituality is important to you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your feelings about spirituality. What I'd like you to do is, is just maybe close your eyes and look inside. I'm going to put this Bible on your right hand. and Just tell me what, what you feel. We're going to get real primitive, you know, not cognitive. What do you feel when you touch this holy book of Christians? Okay? And then over here, I want you to, to feel it over here. And you can see there's no suggestibility in this. I haven't mentioned anything about cults. Right? Okay? Let me give you an a slightly different example. For one patient, I had a Catholic rosary that another ritual abuse survivor had given to me. And I put the rosary in one hand and he felt it. Again, we're just doing an exercise examining their feelings about spirituality. And in the left hand. And when he had it in his left hand, he, he held it very tight and he, his face got very angry and he threw it on the floor. And then I asked him, what do you think is going on? He was scared. He, didn't, he, he could not account for his behavior. So I said, can we do it one more time? And, he, and at first he hesitated, he agreed. And again, the same kind of reaction over here. So what does this tell you all? The right and left side of the body are normally programmed differently. Okay? The, the most common way it's done in my experience is the left side of the body is what? It is sinister, right? Isn't that what, in the Latin word for left is sinister? Sinestra, okay? And then the right hand is benign. Now that's not, it doesn't always work that way, especially in my experience with people that have higher level programming. Um, many times what I've experienced with these individuals is that the process is reversed. That the right hand may have altars that you perceive to be more harmful to the person's well-being and more a threat, whereas the left hand is different. So one thing that you can do is you can do a psychological examine of your, examination of your patient that simply has to do with perceptions of things right and left. Like people talk about right brain, left brain, right? Now, the fact that people have such violent reactions sometimes on one side or the other that are consistent suggests that it's not a right brain, left brain thing. But because people do talk about right brain, left brain, this is not something inconceivable to do in a psychological examination. Or to have the person put their hand on the Bible and just say, I want, I want to know from, from this side of your body how you feel about it. I want to know how you feel about it from this side of the body. And what's remarkable is these folks often show very clearly different feelings about right and left. Now, my argument is that that is due to programming. And as you begin to get a sense about the way the patient experiences the world through the right and left side of their body, you get a better sense about what's going on inside. Now, here's another interesting thing. We talked about light side and dark side. Oftentimes, you may run into patients who describe multiple different perpetrator groups or cult groups, because some of them really may not be perpetrator groups, but they do programming. In other words, the patient may voluntarily go to a shamanistic type group they may experience some pain or discomfort, such as in a sweat, sweat lodge, but not really perceive it as, that, as a victimization of themselves. Or it's possible they could go to an outright satanic meeting, and some part of them, the part that's there, does not feel victimized. It feels like it wants to be there. In any case, many patients are reporting multiple levels of different kinds of programming experiences within different contexts. It's not unusual to find a patient who first presents with you um, stories about abuse at home, and then as you talk more, they talk about maybe um, uh, uh, other kinds of bizarre abuse where it looks like someone's doing something deliberate, and then the robes come out, and then, then you may see Masonic garb, or they may report that, and so on, and so on, and so on. And um, this is not always the case, but I've found quite a few patients who do have this kind of organized structure inside. It's multiple different perpetrator groups 
not just multiple perpetrators, but multiple perpetrator groups. This would tie in with what you've heard today about the Illuminati, for example. The Illuminati would be a structurally higher order cult, if, if indeed that's, again, I, I, I've not seen what they do, so I don't know, for it fact, know about it factually, but it, it's logical. The way cults are organized, if you're familiar with the history of cult organizations, such as the Golden Dawn, for example, what was the inner group of the Golden Dawn called? Do you all know? The Astrum Argentium, the Silver Star, was the, was the, inner, the inner circle of that group, okay? When Aleister Crowley was there, then Aleister Crowley did leave. Cults frequently are organized in a tier level where there's a certain point that you go that you're accepted, and then if you're accepted further, you're allowed in a further inner group. And there may be another inner group and another, just like the way the Masonic um, structure works, basically, where you get promoted up levels and it's more secret and so on and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not slamming the Masons. Um, I'm just saying that this is an occult kind of structure of groups that others like the OTO, the Golden Dawn, also have. In fact, it's been written about. A member, a member of the Golden Dawn, Yates, you know, Yates the poet was a member of the Golden Dawn, and he complained vociferously when several group members talked about the idea of having more and more secret inner groups. He said that if we keep doing that, you know, we could become Satanists and not know it. He said, we could be having rituals on the grave of Christian Rosy Cross. I think I guess he figured Christian Rosy Cross wasn't part of this, but yes. Why do Christians talk to each other? Why does an Episcopalian talk to a Catholic? They all believe in God. Don't they have... I assume these people have a shared experience as well. I don't know. I'm, that would be a good question to ask your high-level uh, survivors. Anyway, I wanted to get back a little bit to the way the body is organized because sometimes when a person is exposed to the programming relative to the body, the way the body is perceived, uh, you may have a person, for example, that this part of the body may be associated with some Santeria experience they had. Uh, they believe it happened in some Caribbean island. Uh, some other part of the body, some specific part, they may associate with abuse at home, etc. Now, it's not always organized precisely in this, in this way, but what I want to suggest to you is it's, it's a good idea to think about the body as a door that can take you into the structure of their own dissociation. For example, what would happen if you told a patient, to, if you said, for a moment, I want you to focus on your, your left hand, the palm of your left hand, right here. Now, this is not an unusual thing in psychotherapy. There are a lot of relaxation tapes that say, focus on your whatever, right? Okay, so what happens if you tell the patient, I want you to focus on the palm of your left hand. In fact, with your permission, I will touch the palm of your left hand, okay? And I want you just to tell me what comes, let, let the person free associate. I think there will be times you will get information. Now, not only does the locus matter, the location matter, the touch matter, but the way you touch. What's going to happen if you do a rotating touch on the palm of the hand? What's gonna happen? Have y'all ever done that? That's what this seminar is all about. Okay, the rotating touch can mean different things, again, depending upon the programming, but commonly, the palm of the hand is a sexual access source. So you, you may want to be careful about that, too. Many therapists complain and, and, and feel uncomfortable about the fact that sometimes their patients seem to become sexually aroused in therapy, and many therapists equate it to the Oedipus complex, right? And maybe that's true. But I believe many therapists are unwittingly accessing the sexual altars in other patients. And so when their patient comes on to them, they feel very threatened and so on. And the patient's likely to feel bad. Again, like a naughty girl, um, something she did was wrong. 
But if we can help the patient get the insight about that, you know, this is normal. This is a normal reaction to someone who has uh, had certain kinds of experiences in, in their life. And let's explore your experiences. In fact, some people will do, there's a, one access that is done where the person uh, rubs their hands together. Also, it makes a difference sometimes whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise. Which way would normally be more powerful? Counterclockwise. Okay. But that's not always true because, again, there are individual differences in the specific way that programming is done. What I want to do is sort of sh give you several directions that you can take and you can kind of explore this with your patients. Um, so, um, what I'm wanting to talk about today, after mentioning a little bit about the body and the way the body is organized and the fact that this has an old occult legacy. Oh, one other thing I want to mention. Uh, right and left, light and dark, where does that come from? Have you noticed that almost every patient who's a multiple talks about a, a, a light side and a dark side? Where does that come from? The Bible. Yes. Look at Genesis. And God separated the light from the dark. Right? But I don't think that all of this really is totally within the mainstream of people who read the Bible. I think it's, uh, in fact, if you get into the Gnostic literature, the Gnostics were a Christian sect that um, um, had a very different point of view from Orthodox Christians. Now, we don't hear much from them because they were basically wiped out as, a, as an above ground religion. They were a heresy, so they were killed off. And... Uh, but uh, they still do, they still are active. I mean, Aleister Crowley, what was, what was Aleister Crowley's most famous ritual ceremony called? You all remember? Somebody, the Gnostic Catholic Mass. Have you all read about the Gnostic Catholic Mass? Okay, if you read Crowley, you'll read about that ritual. It's a sexualized ritual, okay? Gnosticism is a key to all this. It's a very important idea. The idea that there is a deity that, that compromises both good and evil, okay? That's why a lot of this, I don't like to call it satanic because to me, the satanic is, is possibly only one side of what is a religion that is really a religion of light and darkness, good and evil. And if you miss the idea of good and evil, you miss the real thrust of it. And that's why, that's why you have a good side too, and the good side is on a specific side. It's not just random, the person light and dark is randomly distributed throughout the body, etc. So, with that being said, I want to mention that we need to talk about several different ways that access can be done. Um, access can be done by hand gestures, and we have a gentleman who's going to, I guess, show us something along that line. And I'm going to show you some, and uh, others may want to contribute. A specific hand grips, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the secret hand grips. The hand grips can be very effective in accessing people. Now, you're probably wondering, how do you do that in therapy in an appropriate way? You say, hello, uh, I'm your therapist, and I'm not really a Satanist, but I do want to shake your hand this way. Um, and they say, well, my FMS lawyer would like to talk to you. So, how do you do that? Okay, one, one thing I want to emphasize throughout this seminar is that we need to be very creative so that we're, in fact, not putting any kind of ideas in the patient's mind because, again, it, the problem is not that they're going to go attack their family because of false memories. I've never known that to be a case because these patients are dependent, they need their families, and they don't do that. That's just not their scenario. They want their families. They try very hard to cling to their families in spite of repeated memories inside of abuse. So it's just the opposite. But... Um, See, I forgot where I was. <laughs> hand grips, yeah. Okay. So how do we how do we do that? Um, we need to be creative. And here's an example of how one might explore that without introducing false memories and also getting consent. We need to get consent from a person. You don't just give a person a, a bizarre handshake when they're a patient. 
what you can do is ask permission of the patient to do a fantasy exercise. I, I just want to explore your mind. Do I have permission to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to do is close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you're walking through, let's say Paris. Let's make it a nice, pretty scene. We don't want to put any ugly thoughts in people's minds, do we? So you're walking through Paris, and there's some, let's say there's some people there, they're disabled American vets, and you see them there, and they're sitting in the park, and you recognize they're Americans, and you can see that some of them maybe are, have walking sticks and whatnot, and it's a little sad to see that, but, but you understand that that's, that's what's there, that's reality. And maybe one of them greets you and says hello and extends his hand. He sees you're an American too. I wonder if someone would come up here and volunteer. Not a sur I don't want to do this with a survivor though. You will come up and do this. So in the, in the, uh, in the um, fantasy exercise, you can then shake the person's hand, let's say like this. The person's eyes are closed and just ask, now that you've sh you have shook the hand, shaken, whatever, <laughs> what comes in your mind? Now, when the patient jumps out of their seat, you know that something's going on, right? Or when they suddenly switch and they become a little person, they say, my grandfather used to do that. Why are you doing that? You know something has happened. Thanks. Now, this brings another issue that's real important, and that is caution. We've already talked about informed consent. I don't think you can tell a person that you're, you're, you're accessing them directly because that puts ideas in their head. But you can ask permission to explore their mind. I think that's reasonable and fair. You, can't, you should ask permission to touch them. You ought not touch somebody without their permission. The other thing you need to do is think about the safety of the person. That's very important. You ought not access anybody who you believe is not in a position where that would benef not benefit them. They're not guinea pigs. They're not there just to be observed. But if you have a patient who comes in and you have reason to suspect that they might be a ritual abuse survivor, and you know that they're in agony trying to figure out why they're having problems, I think it's reasonable to test that. And that's one way to do it. Um, we'll be going over some other kinds of hand grips as well. So, um, we have hand grips, uh, colors, symbols, diagrams, and graphic patterns, auditory triggers, um, touch and touch patterns, olfactory triggers. In other words, sense of smell can sometimes trigger things. Um, one thing we really need to focus on is the need to be sensitive. Part of my talking about triggering is, all, is not meant to tell you to go trigger your patients. In some cases it may be helpful. But to suggest that we also need to be sensitive to the ways that we may inadvertently trigger a person to do something harmful. For example, what happens when you say to your patient, your patient is crying and they say, no one cares about me. And you say, I care about you. It's with sincerity that you say that. What happens? Yeah. What if you say to them, you have, um, you have this problem and, and you do need to take care of it. You need to take care of it. Is there anything wrong with that? Or is that okay? Okay. Well, some people, some people take care of it means go kill yourself. Or what about keep in touch? Well, okay, we're going to get into some of these different phrases. Now, not everybody's programmed to all the phrases in the same way, but you need to be sensitive to some of the common ones and so part of the purpose of this seminar is, is to, to help people avoid certain things that commonly trigger problems, at least see the concept so you can be watching out. What I found is that um, before patients explained this to me, I frequently had patients going off. And I would be saying things and doing things, and I didn't know what it was. In retrospect, I can go back and see now. Um, and I'm hoping that this kind of information is helpful to therapists. 
But additionally, there may be times you want to trigger the patient either to assist in differential diagnosis, you want to help shut down their system, their specific procedures, such as the example I gave you, in essence, shuts down an ab reaction for some people, apparently. Mm -hmm. okay, it's classical conditioning in sometimes classical conditioning from what I hear sometimes instruction now again I'm not an expert at this I've never seen this happen I just rely on patients and um, the real people who know is you know if you have a patient who's a programmer ask them they're the, they're the experts right um, so I don't want to talk authoritatively about this I can offer my speculations but some of this I believe is done by classical conditioning the, the, uh, the triggering stimulus is, is done, the person is hurt, so they go into a certain state. Like, remember I, earlier I talked about deeper and deeper and deeper, and the person was cut deeper, et cetera. I'm not going to repeat it anymore. Okay? Some of it may be instruction. So the person's already in a dissociated state. Let's say little Freddie's already there. And little Freddie is told, you will do this. So I assume it can happen either way. Again, I don't know. Okay. Well, I wonder... Um, okay. First of all, I really would like to talk a little bit about um, general methods for... I guess what we ought to do is go ahead and I wonder if the gentleman who was willing to share the uh, hand signal would maybe come forward and share that with the group. I was just going to make a preliminary comment that when you're dealing with these program slaves, you'll notice that they have split brain programming. One side will get hot, one side will get cold, and you'll notice that they get headaches on one side of the head. Well, if they get split brain uh, headaches, an Illuminati uh, hand gesture to get over that, if you'll come here. You move this and come down here. Move this and come down here. There's no actual physical contact? No. Okay. That there has put their mind back together. But, uh, okay, what, what the gentleman did is he, he uh, waved his hand in front of my face, uh, going from the top of my head down without contact, and then across, like a cross, and then with both hands around, like an oval, uh, or parentheses, uh, type shape. And then I would add this comment that whenever you're doing hand signals or access codes or, or uh, using uh, hypnotic induction, the uh, slaves are oftentimes cued to only take these things from their handler. And so you, can, uh, you need to be uh, sensitive as to when you use them because uh, you just don't use them um, in all cases. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can use it on yourself, right. Maybe at first if you need to use a mirror to uh, see what you're doing. Yeah, you can use a mirror. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, the question is, how do you distinguish split brain headaches from migraines that are unilateral? I wonder if the gentleman could respond to that.
Right, but then some some vascular headaches are on one side. How would one distinguish just a physiological vascular headache from, say, an MPD type headache? Is there? Do you have any thoughts? Okay, I think the answer is there may be some occasions where you simply don't know, but there may be other occasions where there's some reason to believe that a headache may be uh, caused by some internal punitive action, that is what I hear you saying, and that's been my observation. Sure. I tell you what, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, is I, I want to cover as much of this as I can, maybe save the questions for the end, if that's okay with everybody, because um, we really have a lot to talk about here. Right, headaches are often associated with dissociation and et cetera. Um, I'd like to talk about a few other hand gestures. Um, what I'd like to do is show you a hand gesture that um, patients sometimes use. Have you ever seen patients in group therapy uh, and, and you look around, there's maybe eight people there and, every, and like six of them have their hands all in the same formation. Have you ever noticed that? Okay, let me show you one. The, uh, the hands are folded, they're kind of interwoven backwards, so it looks like sort of an eight with your arms interwo interweaving that way. Now, has anyone ever seen that? Okay, who, who knows what that means? Pardon me? Is it a resistance? That's my, as best as I can tell from asking people about it, it means don't talk. But I, again, uh, I'm not absolutely certain that's the meaning. I see someone shaking their head back there. Can you respond? It means infinity. Okay, I've heard something like that, but again, they interpret it to mean don't talk because you can't get out of the circle. I've, I've heard that. So I don't know for certain, that's just what I've heard, and, but I have seen, I've, I've gone to group, and uh, maybe out of eight people, six of them are sitting there doing that. So if you're, if you're in therapy with somebody and you see their hands interwoven that way, you might ask them to not do that. In fact, body posture and body language, even though I don't really get into body language as an interpretive thing, you might want to watch their body language. At times, some, some patients will cross you off They'll cross their legs. Sometimes they'll cross their arms. And a lot of times you'll notice while they're in that posture, basically what they're doing is they're triggering the ones inside to shut up. And uh, if you'll ask them to sit a different way, in a non-threatening way, a lot of times you'll get more material from them. Uh, um, let sure. Right. Sure. Of course, that's what they're told, and we can see by all the people here that apparently that's not true. Uh, they may be told that, but um, this stuff apparently doesn't have this absolute kind of control that, that people are often told about. Um, so I wanted to, to show you a couple of hand, uh, hand uh, signs. That's one. Another one that you need to use with caution uh, which tends to cause patients to dissociate. It's a little bit threatening, although I've never had any patient respond to me as though they were afraid of me, uh, but I want to show it to you. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm making a fist with my right hand. I'm cupping my left hand over it so that you see the, um, the edge. My left hand is shaped like the, uh, the letter C. So you see um, the letter C pointing outward um, with the thumb surface of my hand pointing outward, curved. And then you see the fist inside it. OK, 
Okay. Once that formation is made, then the left hand moves three times over the knuckles. One, two, three. Okay. Now, some patients, uh, my understanding of the meaning behind that is, is symbolic of intrusive, painful sexual contact where the fist here is the threatening sexual object being thrust inside. Is what I'm told. Now I don't know for a fact that that's the case because no, none of the patients who have experienced this have have responded traumatically, but they do trance out. Uh, additionally, I think I've mentioned that um, um, in a legal case I was involved in, a uh, one of the convicted perpetrators, the Keller Daycare case. Uh, the fellow was was seen to make this hand hand gesture. Was even gotten on the news. And uh, he walks into the room doing this, and uh, he, he does it another time. I don't know if that's connected with the same thing or not. Again, these are things that, that we will only come to understand by, by checking it out over time. And indeed, some of them may be coincidental. You know, some of them may be that, that someone just did this at that time, and there's really no significance to it. But if we find that this patient, this patient, and this patient, and so on, in Dallas, in California, in New York, or wherever in different places are reacting to it in a, a similar way, then we have to say something's going on there. That's what science is all about. We study phenomena, observable phenomena. Now, we don't want to be doing things to patients that are harmful. We don't want to do things to patients that are frightening. But if a patient comes in to you and says, I feel really stuck, there may be some signals that, that cause them to be more open. That, that may be something that's okay. If the patient already has an awareness of ritual abuse, they may, you may be able to get explicit permission. That is, you can discuss it because you're not putting the ideas in their mind. You might say, do I have permission to attempt to access you, since they've already talked about accessing. And then they can say yes or no. And some of them want it videotaped so they can see it happen. And the other thing is you want to, like I said before, you want to avoid accessing them accidentally. Okay. Uh, I saw a speaker one time talking to people with their hand in this formation and uh, this was a speaker who speaks on the subject of ritual abuse. What I have is my ring finger bent at approximately a 90 degree angle, 45 degree angle, whatever. My geometry is out today. And uh, now this is a very powerful something. I don't know exactly what it is, but people go into a trance frequently. And some patients will do this too. They will extend their hand and, and, and so on. I see a comment here. Well, actually these patients respond more to this. The salute of horns. Okay. While we're on the salute of horns, there are several different ways to do it. Some people do it like this. Some people do it like this. Some people do it like one, two, three, where uh, sometimes, in other words, the thumb is underneath the two middle fingers, and then the pointer finger and little finger extended. Sometimes the thumb is on top of the two middle fingers with the, thumb, with the uh, pointer and middle finger extended. Sometimes the ring finger comes first, the thumb second, and the middle finger last, like that. Now, I, this to me is so obvious that uh, I, I would never use this as a way to access somebody because, I mean, what are you going to do when the FMS lawyer says, is it true you gave a satanic salute to your patient? What are you going to say? Um, see, all I, all I, now if, if I should do this, if, should I do this, I can say truthfully that I, I used a hand signal that I was told caused trance response with some people. I guess that's another, again, there may be ways to disguise this, but to me, that just seems awfully obvious. The other thing is, this is 
I think a genuine, sincere expression of that religion, I would be reluctant to to do something that would be acknowledging that I um, have acknowledged it that seriously, you know. Uh, just like I would not uh, kneel down and say a prayer of a faith that I'm not a part of, uh, I, I would personally be very uncomfortable with giving a salute of horns which might uh, be interpreted as some endorsement of uh, some kind of uh, malignant philosophy. I'm sure it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and this, is, this is difficult. We have to decide, you know, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate. There, there obviously, it would be inappropriate to have a patient come in and just trigger them so they left in a panic. On the other hand, if the patient came in, they were triggered, the memories opened up, they were able to talk about it, pull together, and leave in a good place, then to me, that's like doing surgery and opening the patient and closing the patient. To me, that's, uh, that's like avoiding hospitalization. You can do really heavy-duty work in your limited amount of time, pull the person together again, and uh, I, I view it personally as a very efficient way to work. Well, um, I'd like to say a few other words about, a, well, there, there are other hand gestures as well. What I'm proposing that you, some of you who work with patients, you might want to talk with your patients and ask them more about what, you know, if, if they have the knowledge that hand gestures are used, you can pose the question directly. But if they don't have that knowledge, you might simply ask them, for example, um, how does it feel when they hold their hand different ways? Or how do, how do they feel when people gesture at them? How, how do they feel when people say hello? For example, here's, here's a way that I understand that accessing occurs as a greeting. Uh, the thumb and the pointer finger are touching, either crossed or simply touching. And the other three fingers wave three times. So you all do it circularly. That's one way I've heard of, yeah. And, uh, and you, you don't, you know, this, this lady here is not waving. She's just doing the circular hand movement. The three fingers are curled and extended. Um, the most common way I've heard of it is there's a, there's a wave with it. Now, the reason this is important is some of your patients will report to you they've been accessed out in the, out in the public. And some of them, later when you get to their memory of what actually happened, you'll find out somebody gave them this kind of wave and you'll, you'll find out then they've got people inside that, that will wave back. And it's good to work with those folks so you can decrease the likelihood of someone getting reinvolved with some other group or some other perpetrator. Okay, so we talked about hand gestures. Um, I briefly mentioned one hand grip. I'd like to mention a couple of hand grips. Um, one is a Masonic hand grip. I believe it's called the lion's paw. And what you do is you... Um, um, basically, you grip the person's thumb with, between your thumb and your index finger. The other three fingers, your little finger, your middle finger, and, and your index finger, are curled against the person's wrist. So you're, you're holding it like so. When it's done properly, sometimes the nails are dug in into the other wrist slightly. It's, it's a somewhat threatening... Now, here, we need to do it... Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so, the the pointer the the pointer finger and the thumb are circled around his thumb like so, and then three fingers these three fingers go against the wrist. Now, if I'm wanting to establish dominance, I might press, especially, and I might pull forward because it's used in a pulling ritual with the masons. But you don't have to pull it. Again, the idea behind triggering is you create a situation that's fairly close to the trauma, the stimuli associated with the trauma. You don't want, it to, you don't want to horrify and scare the person, but you want to help them start to become aware of what is inside. Now, most of these things that I'm showing you are, are simply things that, in my experience, tend to cause people to go into a trance and may bring out a particular altar. I'm not going to discuss any triggers that I'm familiar with that cause destructive reactions. I'm simply not going to talk about them. Now, there are some that I'm told are typically used for that purpose. And you might ask your patients so that you don't accidentally... On one occasion, I was sitting in group therapy with my hands both behind my head comfortably, 
and the patient was freaking out saying that she remembered a ritual where the high priest had uh, both hands behind the head and this may not have been done deliberately in, in the patient's programming or it may have been but either way it's disturbing to the person we need to be very very sensitive to pe the way people feel about things and one thing I tell patients once they recognize that they are ritual abuse patients is that if there's anything I say or do that makes you uncomfortable please let me know immediately okay because I think that your feelings are important and should be treated with respect and it's okay a lot of the survivors they feel guilty because they know they go off when people do things that seem neutral someone crosses their legs a certain way and they go off and they feel guilty they feel like something's wrong with me we need to give permission that it's okay the fact that you're disturbed by that it's not your fault and I want to try to limit the way if I'm doing that I want to limit it because I don't want to provoke you I don't want to make you more uncomfortable and I think that that should be respected so we've talked about a couple two hand grips one is a hand grip where the the middle finger is bent toward the palm and then the person shakes hand and basically because the middle finger is bent toward the palm uh, the person feels that finger pressing against their palm now in some cases when I've used this with some patients they respond in a sexual manner not typically but occasionally again I mentioned before the palm is a common sec site for sexual access okay another hand grip the one that I first learned about is done with the two two fingers the index finger and middle finger which are curled around the other person's um, hands um, now a survivor okay okay good answer so it's like this and then you grip tight like so and then you say you are one of us well actually that would be kind of strong I wouldn't want to freak somebody out but if the person if you really want to use something powerful if you want to use it in a powerful way like that and you want to use the words that commonly go with it you might say and one of the remember going back to the GIs who are uh, veterans and, and disabled veterans go back to that scenario and he says an American I'm glad to see you and he, he shakes your hand and says and you are one of us if you think it's safe to be that intense now this is where you have to judge how the, where the patient is what they can stand but there are times obviously the patient wants you to draw out altars and if you can help them do that and they don't feel intruded upon and they feel treated with respect is something that's useful obviously just to go up to somebody you, you see in the mall that you think is a survivor and do that would be abusive or to do it against someone's will yes ma'am in the back holding on a person's two fingers okay I'd be careful though because that's okay okay and you can use some of these cult postures and phrases and whatnot to to indicate to the person that they are getting out certainly you need to be careful though that you're not telling them something that uh, um, is not helpful obviously we're entering an area that is potentially dangerous but the reason I mention this to you is because to me this area is extremely powerful you you do get very powerful states when you use this method I, I personally have worked with people that go into trances that are so deep that they are coma like they're stuporous now it's not that that's helpful but if this person responds so powerfully to let's say a, a piece of music that they go into a stuporous trance then that patient needs to know about it and they need to start working to desensitize the reaction so they cannot be accessed further so part of this is not just to access states you're going to use in therapy part of this is to help teach the patient what they respond to and then help them so they don't respond to it anymore so they get control over their own programming which really I think 
is, is one of the goals of therapy. So I've talked about a few hand grips. I wonder if anyone else would like to add any other. Another hand grip is with the salute of horns where you slide. One person slides it under the other one. But that's so obvious. And again, I, I just, I don't feel right about introducing that in therapy. But uh, some people may, who, who knows. Does anyone have any other hand grips there whereof they'd like to share with the group? Yes, ma'am. An acknowledgement of uh, submissiveness from a survivor or, or to a handler or whatever is uh, reach out as though you're going to shake my hand. Do you see the difference? I just laid my left hand in his hand. Just submissive, just, just, and intimate. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, additionally, when you shake hands with many survivors, one thing therapists may note, they tend to hold their palm away from you. Uh, have you ever noticed that often when you shake hands, you get this real hollow handshake? It may be tight, but the palm is... So whenever you get a handshake like that, there's something to think about. You know, you may possibly be dealing with a survivor. You know, it could be a coincidence. Sometimes I'll shake several times with the person before I go with that as a as an hypothesis. But when a person extends their, their palm, they may be protecting their palm, or they may be allowing you the leeway so if you want to insert your finger or what have you, you can. Indeed, many survivors do shake, in my experience, in the manner that was um, shown. Now, also, with handshakes, you might be interested in, in the expression of dominance and submissiveness. If you're dealing with a patient who is expressing to you, not only through, through handshakes, through other behaviors, a sense of submissiveness, you may want to start to explore, you know, what can I do to facilitate this person's autonomy? Because I don't want to become her new handler, you know. I don't want this to become a cult of therapy. So you need to be thinking about that. Occasionally you'll have patients who are quite autonomous and, and that doesn't necessarily need to be a focus of therapy. But in other cases it really is. And it doesn't only come, come out through their discussions of their everyday life. It, it comes out through uh, even pro what appear to be programmed responses. Okay, colors I'm not going to say too much about. I think Dr. Mangazi did a whole presentation on it. Um, I'll just say a few things. Um, um, there are several colors I very commonly see my patients wearing. Um, I think the most common combination is red and black. That's the most common combination. Sometimes you'll see, and a second most frequent in my experience is purple, purple and black. Um, it's my understanding, and again, I may be off, that purple has something to do with the, uh, the high priest. Of course, some groups use red to be a, an important position as well, but it's my understanding that many, many colors, red and black, are sort of like the color of the concept. Okay, blood and, and, and life and death, red and black. And then uh, purple, often patients, you'll see them in a benign mood when purple is there. Uh, purple, although it's malignant in a sense, when we're talking about a high priest or what have you, there's also a healing factor. And that's, we need to be non-judgmental about these things and realize that this is, in some cases, a religion. People believe in it, in some cases, sincerely. And we're going to make the best contact with the dark altars if we can show them that we respect them, even though we don't personally agree with their decisions uh, about um, treating other people's lives and their own life and their own safety. Um, if we can do that, I think we can get in touch with these ones and then oftentimes make more progress. Um, so the color purple, many times patients will react to it in a benign way. If, if you see two people interacting, the one with the purple often will take a more dominant role, at least in my experience. Now, you, then you get certain color combinations. Uh, it's my understanding that gold is a hereditary um, color of rank, that they're frequently gold belts for hereditary um, in some groups, um, if they're in a hereditary type cult or organization, what have you, um, and they're, th there's some hereditary rank associated, they may have the gold belt to signify that. Uh, there may be some other kind of symbolic apparel. Um, additionally, uh, solid robes, like a pr solid purple robe, a solid red robe, uh, are often indicative of rank. The complexity 
and the decoration on the robe may be a factor that's used by the particular group. I'm told that different colors mean different things in different groups, that there's not an all universal standard kind of uh, interpretation. The Ku Klux Klan wears white. White was the color of the, um, the, uh, the ancient, some of the uh, like Gnostics. White was their color. And, um, and I, I believe there are some groups that, that wear white sometimes and black sometimes. And then there may be other colors that are seasonally related. They have a seasonal meaning uh, and so on. Uh, silver is, I'm told, in some groups, women wear silver. Again, silver is a color representing the moon. Diana, Hecate, etc. I won't say any more words, but those kind of folks. Um, because the, the names of gods, by the way, and demons often are triggering. So when you're sitting there with your patient, you keep using the word Satan. Most of you are not talking about Belial in conversation with your patient, but uh, you might be talking about Satan, Satan, Satan. And next thing you know, don't be surprised if the person's coming at you. You may have triggered some of their angry ones, or you may have triggered an internal Satan. Okay. Um, We need to talk about um, general methods for opening up versus shutting down the system. This is an important thing. Obviously, some patients are programmed, they say, to be shut down when they come to your office. And then they're there for an hour or so, 45 minutes. And then they, they, they may open up again. That is be more vulnerable to access. There are several ways to affect shut down versus closed up nature of the system. Um, one is simply to talk to the patient about it and, again, try to facilitate their own control over their own system of alters and their own system of dissociation. And that really ultimately is, is the goal. We really want to facilitate patients getting control of their own lives. We don't want to just teach them techniques and tricks. We don't want to teach them medications that help in the long run. In the long run, the goal is, I respect you. You're a human being. You have a right to control your own life. And I totally support that. But in the meantime, there are things that may help. For one, medication. Now, I, I'm not giving any advice about medications because everybody here, you know, including me, is worried about lawsuits and this, that, and the other. So I'm just telling you about what I've seen happen to my patients on medications prescribed by an appropriate physician. Okay? Um, neuroleptics tend to shut down the system the problem is it tends to shut down the helper ones first, in many cases. Neuroleptics are antipsychotic medications, Melaril, Haldol, uh, Thorazine. If you're dealing with a patient who has um, uh, ritual abuse or MPD, I'd be very careful of long-acting um, neuroleptics. Again, I'm not giving you advice about medication, but you may want to discuss with the physician the appropriateness of prescribing. You know, there are injectable neuroleptics that are long-acting. This can be extremely, in my experience, extremely harmful to the patient. If you use a neuroleptic, or if the patient's going to use a neuroleptic, it should be short-acting. It should be used PRN, not every day if possible. So, so when the person is falling apart and they need a little glue to hold things together and they've sorted out with a physician the appropriate way to do it, a neuroleptic will sometimes help. Now, I'm told by some patients, especially higher level patients, they were trained to go berserk with neuroleptics or have other problems. Again, I don't know the reality of this. I don't know that there, there may be patients that do deteriorate. I don't know. I do know that they will tend to deteriorate at least briefly after the neuroleptic because you've, you've, the helper alters go to sleep first. So what I, what I discuss with patients when they've been prescribed by a physician, a neuroleptic, is the idea of considering to take, taking it and then taking a nap if they're in a safe place. And they go to sleep while the helper alters are also going to sleep. And then they tend to wake up shut down, feeling okay. So that's neuroleptics. Antidepressants tend to mildly shut down the system. Um, you'll notice that with most ritual abuse survivors, Antidepressants don't work very long. They may work a month or two, and then it seems like they stop working. Yes, sir. Well, 
Well, in my experience, all of them, but again, I, uh, most of the antidepressants I'm familiar with have sedative effects. Uh, but even... Uh, Okay, I'm, what I propose to you is there's a tendency to be more shut down. It's been my observation, but you might, you know, consider what you're observing also. Um, I don't think that these are ultimate truths that I'm telling you they're universally true. They're simply my observations. Uh, now, anti-anxiety agents um, can go either way, um, like especially benzodiazepines, things like um, Valium, which is not used much anymore. Xanax is more common. Uh, but Xanax can often be helpful simply because it helps the person calm down. Uh, I've had some patients that report feeling more opened up. They're, in other words, they're able to calm down enough they can open up. Then there are others that feel more shut down. It's as though the internal pressure helps them open up, and when you relax them, they get more shut down. So I think there are individual differences. Barbiturates are a class of drug that tend to really open people up. Unfortunately, with all this false memory suing of people, uh, I don't know people who are doing this now. It's a very effective technique. It does not yield perfectly accurate memories, though. But it does cause a person to open up when they need to. And occasionally, you'll find a suicidal patient that says, if I could only get this out, I know I would feel better. If I could only feel it. And uh, these pe people might be excellent candidates for that, but I doubt that there are very many professionals who will do it now, given that everybody's getting sued who... Where some, well, sodium amytal is, is what's often used for, a, like a sodium amytal interview. Uh, that's one of the better ones. Um, but any barbiturate tends to cause the system to open up. Okay, and you need to be aware of that too, because some patients, for example, they're going to have like dental work done, and they, they told them they're, they're going to give them uh, sodium, uh, whatever, you know, one of the barbiturates. And these patients will start to get strange in the dental office. And, and you need to, this is where it's helpful to know about this, know how some things open up the system, some shut them down, because you, you might want to warn the patient and, and make sure she's with a professional who can handle whatever occurs. Because he may be talking to a little kid, you know. And if he can't handle it, then the patient may feel abused because they're not treated with appropriate respect in that situation. Okay, so these are things that tend, these are drugs, okay. What about other things that open and shut down the system. Sir? No, what is MDMA? Does anyone know anything about MDMA and, and multiples here? Looks like nobody has any familiarity with that. Sorry. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about TAPS. That's an important, uh, well, yeah. In a way, we're talking about general themes of access, like opening up, closing. Yeah, tapping, tapping is, is another, uh, but tapping often specific little accesses, particular altars usually, and, and the whole system may not be wide open. But one of the things about opening up a system is the more you encourage the dissociation, that is, you encourage another altar to be out other than the host, the more they're open, wide open. So sometimes patients, for example, they may say, um, let's say you're you're, you want to talk to an altar called the killer, let's say. Okay. The system, the patient wants that altar to come out and talk, but he says, not on your life. Okay, so what do you do? This is a typical problem that patients have. The patient wants it. The patient asks for help. The patient says, I really need to deal with this. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt somebody. And then you feel like, well, I have an ethical responsibility to respond to this. I have a patient saying they're afraid they might hurt somebody. I have to respond to it, you know. Now, if it's acute, you may say well, they need to be in the hospital. But if it's not acute, you can't do that. So what do you do? Well, you need to start talking to the killer, right? Okay. So what if the killer says, I'm not going to talk to you? 
Okay, here's a way to open up the system. And again, the, the more open you get it, the easier it is to get all of them to come out, right? So you might start with a little child that's easy to talk to. And you keep, you, you keep the person talking, you, bring, you call out, it's okay to call out altars. A lot of therapists want to be psychoanalytical about it and say, just wait for the altars to come out. Um, obviously, you don't want to call out um, some violent, aggressive one when it may cause harm to yourself or the patient. But um, if there's some rationality or logic to it, it's okay to do that. So, um, you might talk to a little child over here. If you know a little bit about the structure and the layout of the system, what I find is the more different areas of the system you go to, the more the whole thing is opened up. It's sort of like you can encircle it, and the more you do that, the easier it is to get to the whole system. The more you, are, you allow yourself to stay compartmentalized dealing with the altars, the harder it is to get over here. So you may spend 30 minutes doing that, and then before you know it, the killer may be talking to you. You know, he, he may say, I don't like you talking to all my people, and then you got him there. Another thing that I think is kind of interesting, you can use direct cult access. You know, just, uh, for example, um, one low-level access, verbal access, is you will obey and come forth. Okay? It's a, it's a low level. It's not a real powerful... And it's, I believe it's more associated with the ceremonial-type cults, like the, what people are calling the Luciferian and Satanic, rather than, um, uh, say, like Santeros and... Bodun folks and, and whatnot. But uh, one thing that I'm always amused by is dealing with altars called Satan. I really like to work with them. I really like them. In fact, I think I was quoted on Primetime Live saying I like Satan. But um, that's not entirely true. I believe that the altars that were used to make figures like Satan and Lucifer actually are among the very best inside, and that's why that was done. But also, more importantly, they were hurt. And when you look past the image of Satan or Lucifer, you see a hurt kid. And so I feel a real desire to meet that hurt kid. And I feel real compassion for that hurt kid. So I'm, I'm often very enthused about the chance to talk to Satan because that lets me get to the hurt kid that really is the one that's there. So sometimes it's amusing when... when uh, it's possible to talk to these patients and, and getting permission. Sometimes a patient will say, I think I'm demon-possessed or whatever, and uh, I wish I could get, uh, get in touch with that, whatever it is inside. And so I might ask permission if they already know about it. I, I'm not going to call out Satan with a patient I don't know or haven't gotten permission, explicit permission for that. But if I know it's safe, um, one thing that's amusing to me is to use a low-level command like Satan, the, the phrase I just used, I don't want to be repeating these lucks. I don't want to be messing with people that may react to them. But it's, um, you will obey and come forth. Okay? Or you can reverse those. It can be come forth first. And then the other word. Okay? And what's amusing is, invariably Satan comes out. But real angry and indignant, like, how dare you speak to me that way? Who do you think you are? You have no power over me. You're, you're a slimy scum to me. And, and so I, I, I say, well, yeah, I, I apologize for the disrespect because I've, I think it's important to be respectful even to altars that, that consider themselves demons. And if it was a real, I've never seen a real demon, anything I recognize as a real demon, but if I did, I'd be respectful of that too. Um, I believe in respect. doesn't matter. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm not better than a demon or better than an altar, and so I feel like it's important to be respectful. So what's amusing, though, is then to, to acknowledge, I, poly, you know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I did want to talk to you, but the, the amusing thing I have to notice is that you did come, <laughs> you know. And um, so um, often it helps patients to have the violent ones called out to learn that they're not really so bad as they thought. And I've called out some of the most sweetest Satans that you could ever wish to meet. Um, in fact, when I was, that thing was done on uh, Primetime Live, this patient had just this, this, it was a little kid altar is what it was. You, you couldn't, the, the Satan side of it wasn't well developed. As you all probably know, they usually have levels of Satan, so too. And with important altars, you may have some that are more benign than others. Others may be more violent. And I, I don't know that she had a series. 
she may have merely had one benign or she may have had a, a whole bunch but the one that came out was a sweet little little child and and uh, of course they got me saying that I thought this altar was was nice and I liked the altar and uh, so uh, made me look kind of strange on TV but that's okay um, so opening up versus shutting down the system what are some other things okay one thing that I love to use is music music um, is something that uh, something that uh, gets to people and a lot of programming is done with music I'm told in fact um, this is how it generally is done chanting is music right I mean that's the old way but now that we have you know phonographs and now we have tapes and discs we can play music and we can play sounds. Uh, for example, let me give you an example here. This is one that works beautifully, but it's fairly obvious. And you don't always want to use things that are fairly obvious. This is just a little Casio um, dealy. Looks like it's running out of electricity. Now I don't want to mean, be too provocative, but I want to show you a little bit about how this works. As you slow down the tempo of any kind of a device with a tempo, you often get a reaction from the person. People who are programmed often, not always, but often relax. Now what happens when you increase the tempo? Okay. Is everybody okay? Oh, okay, good. Now, you probably wonder, how do you use this in therapy? <laughs> now this, again, the idea is, how do we be creative so it's appropriate? It wouldn't be appropriate to pull out a Casio with, in therapy and say, I, 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 you know, I'd like you to listen to my Casio. You know, that's not appropriate. So how could, how could a person make this appropriate? Do you have any thoughts or ideas? Okay. Let's think about what music means to you. A lot of these folks, just like a lot of other folks, music is an important part of their emotional life. And it, it carries important meanings and, and represents feelings inside. So what if I said, um, I want you to picture I want you to picture that maybe you're listening to some rock music let's say someone who likes that and you hear the sound of it and for a, mo for a moment I just want you to associate with the, the rock music now this isn't actually rock music but that's okay and I want you to free associate okay now I might lower it might slow it down some Tell me what comes in your mind, you know. The person might say, I feel relaxed. Or they might say, you know, not, nothing. It just sounds like funny sound. But some groups, some, some survivors will have heard something like this. If you can add in, it is done, or something like that, you may get a reaction, if that's what you're seeking. Now, on the other hand, you want to be very careful, because you don't want to frighten somebody, you don't want to cause them to go into an ab reaction. But again, if you understand how this works, you can travel the paths inside their mind, back and forth. This kind of thing tends to work toward opening up the person. Now, the other thing, uh, I hate to be morbid, but sometimes there's no way to avoid it. Some of this may be accidental. Some patients describe situations where they were sexually abused 
and music was played to cover up their sounds. Um, there may be other occasions though where it really was deliberate abuse. I wonder if anyone recognizes that tune that's Dancing with Mr. D. It's one of the first Rolling Stone songs that has to do with um, uh, Satan kinds of stuff. Now, I don't use real obvious things like this because someone's going to say you're planning ideas in their mind. But what happens when we play song number two? Okay. Now, there's no suggestion here of cult activity, but some of these folks will react to another song on an album that has a, quote, satanic song on it. For example, um, um, this is one that a lot of folks react to. Um, the Rolling Stones song, Angie. Now, another thing you'll notice is many of the songs, um, when they have a name associated with it, like Angie or uh, what have you, any song with a name, Frequently, you'll get an altar come out that has that name. That's another idea to keep in mind. So, um, now I've got a list of songs in the back. Um, and music, not just songs. Now, the other thing you can do that's very powerful with this is you can play multiple things at once. We have a little Cat Stevens. That's too obvious. I wouldn't do that. Okay, this is all music that's commercially available and people are listening to it. Um, now, under most conditions, I would not use something as obvious as this Enigma tape. You know, Enigma is real popular. They have a track on uh, a movie somewhere. Uh, here's something that's very helpful is foreign language tapes. Put in a foreign language tape. Yes, a uh, Spanish tape. This is how programming often is done. Um, and if you know that, you can use this in therapy to access different states. If you use simultaneous... Uh, I, I, I use this, um, this one here. This jam box is uh, two tape, and you can play them simultaneously. So you can get that effect. Sometimes people will, uh, multiples will frequently dissociate when they hear two simultaneous sounds. Now another thing auditorily that's helpful, I mentioned the, uh, something like this, are um, metronomes. Now hypnotists use metronomes, right? Why do metronomes work? They don't do anything to me. I mean, it's just a ticking sound. I was, I was doing a talk some time ago in Austin, and I had a metronome running. Let's see if I can find my metronome. Um, and it was interesting because one of the the people there tranced out so that he was looked like he almost fell out of his chair. I, I wasn't deliberately trying to access anybody. I didn't know anybody in there would be vulnerable. I was simply trying to explain a little bit about stimuli that can cause people to trance. Now, why would why would a metronome cause a person to trance? Pardon? It's repetitive. Well, it might cause a light trance just because it's repetitive. Indeed, repetitive stimuli do that. But what happens if, if you do this and you get a whole new system of the altar coming, a whole new system of the, the person coming out? 
What happens if you combine this with something else? Some of these combinations may sound very bizarre to hear because obviously I'm just throwing them, them together very quickly. But for some folks, um, when it's done appropriately, it's not bizarre. You might, for example, ask the person, uh, this is typically how I do it, is I, I discuss with them the idea of dissociating. This is not something I just throw at them. But, you know, is it okay? Here's one way that some people explore their dissociations. They simultaneously listen to two or more pieces of music, and uh, there's certain pieces of music that are often very provocative. I was playing um, the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah. Do you suppose that would be provocative with any of these folks? Yeah, why not? Um, what are some of these other pieces of music here? Let's quickly go over some of them. How are we doing time-wise? Okay. Right. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Firajaka. Firajaka. Okay. The, I've heard so many patients talk about Firajaka that this, this is one of the most common I hear about. In fact, I had one patient who's, whose boyfriend apparently was involved in something. That's what she alleged. Um, uh, used the tune first with her, and it seemed odd to her. He's sitting in the car singing Frere Jacques, a little kid song, and she was going berserk. Um, why is Frere Jacques so provocative? Brother John, Brother John, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Morning bells are ringing. Ding, dang, dong. Ding, dang, dong. I don't know, you know. Is, do some of these people view this as John, is John Jacques de Malay, Brother John, Frere, Frater, Jacques? I don't know. But anyway, people do respond to it. You all know about Jacques de Malay, right? Okay. Well, he, he was a Knights Templar, last Knights Templar, a Grand Master, uh, put on the stake for witchcraft and heresy and all that stuff. And, and now, we don't really know if these allegations were true. But we know that a lot of occult groups believe that, and they revere him. He's sort of a, uh, an important figure in, for some occult persons. In the back? Yeah. Now, Frere Jacques can be done just a simple, just just hearing the tune, or it can be sung. In fact, the, I became aware of Frere Jacques when I was, back when I was at this hospital I mentioned. Um, I, I went in for my group therapy, and the patients in the hospital had just been in another group, and they're all stoned, they're all tranced out, and I asked them, why are you all so spacey today? And they didn't know why, and finally somebody said, the music he played, or again, after many repeated questions, I finally got out. The previous therapist had just come in and was talking about the keys on a piano, about how their, their selves are like the keys on a piano, and had the black keys and the white keys, and, you know, like Frere Jacques, and he went, Frere Jacques, Frere, and they were out. Now, again, I don't know whether this was deliberate or just a coincidence, but um, 
a lot of this stuff we will get from our patients when they describe incidents where they do feel particularly spacey. But Farrah Jacques is one. What about Mary Had a Little Lamb? Okay. A lot of times you'll get, you'll get somebody out with that song. Now, how do you do this in an appropriate way? What if you say, I would like to explore childhood feelings. I'd like to play some, some music that relates to childhood feelings. Is that okay? Do I, have, do I have permission to explore your mind? And then you can play this. And again, if the patient is safe, you don't ever want to provoke somebody that's not in a position to, to go that direction. But I believe that this can speed up some of the process of exploring that when it is safe for the person. What about Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? And it, sometimes you'll hear about the bright morning star, about this. Sometimes you'll hear about other things. Uh, how about Hickory Dickory Dock? Okay. Hourglasses are, are important. Since, since he mentioned hourglasses, uh, one of the things that uh, Mark Phillips told me that he used for accessing people in a hypnotic context was the idea of asking the person to imagine that they were sitting on top of the sand in an hourglass. Imagine you're very small and you're sitting on top of the sand in the hourglass and the sand is running down and down and you're running down with it and you go right through. Now, you see all those triggers there. We have the hourglass, the, the sand, the running down and the I mean, he came up with all this stuff. I thought, that's remarkable, all that triggering stuff. That would be a powerful way to induce a trance for a survivor. Okay. Um, anyway, these songs, uh, there's a Peter, Paul, and Mary song, I'm in love with the big blue frog. A lot of times, child altars like this song. This is not one that is real intrusive or uh, disturbing. Um, it is one that um, often is, is comforting. You want to learn how to trigger comforting reactions, too, obviously. We want to comfort our patients. In fact, that's really the ultimate goal. What about Ring Around the Rosie? That's another one that's obvious. You all know about Ring Around the Rosie? Pardon me? Mary, Mary, Quite Contrary. That's not a song, but a poem, poem nursery rhyme. Brahms Lullaby. You'll find a lot of people go to sleep to Brahms Lullaby. Now, especially if you, if you play Brahms Lullaby and you find some other combination of sounds that it could be this. You have to experiment a little bit sometimes to find out what exactly works. Um, now, along with this music, one of the most important things I need to mention, like when you're driving a car, you need to learn how to use your brakes first. You want to know things that help calm the person down, help soothe the person, help shut the person down. That's the first thing you want to learn. So anytime you're wanting to explore accessing methods with patients, first, the concern is how do I get you back? If we ever get somewhere that we don't want to be, you know, like let's say you're driving a car, suddenly you look down, you're going 60 miles an hour. Okay, I need to slow down. Okay, if I get to a place where I don't want to be, how do I get out of it? Well, music is an excellent way to return to a normal either helper state or um, to a state where um, the main host personality is out. If you, uh, now, sometimes you can find this out with a person by, they may tell you what their favorite song is. A lot of times a song will be a, a popular, uh, pleasant song. Um, uh, and, and again, this varies from person to person. But one advantage is if you get a patient who starts to react too excessively, you know, and suddenly things are, are heading to be not okay, all you have to do is push the button and the song is playing. That is calling back the person to the safe state. And if you have permission, you can also, let me show you a couple other ways to call back. I wonder if I have a non-survivor who could, um, I could uh, demonstrate this with. A non How about Tori? Tori's getting his non-survivor altar out. Here are a couple of common ways to do a return type. And by return, I mean returning back to the host state or to a stable state if ever you're in a situation where 
things are, are not okay. Or you don't, let's say the person's been there long enough and you want to return, they're having a hard time returning back. Here are a couple of, of uh, access methods that commonly, not always, return patients. Now the other thing about this I should mention before I go into it, is if you show the patient some of these things, a lot of times they'll tell you, no, you don't do it that way, you do it this way. And they, sh they will often show you. And this way you can really learn the appropriate ways to investigate their programming uh, responses and accessing stimuli. Let's imagine that Tori is tranced out and uh, we have uh, an assassin programmer out, let's say, or an assassin out, and we're not real comfortable with the situation. Um, now, what I might do is play, I'm not going to walk behind him, but I'm over there, and I have my music, and I press down the button, and I'm playing a song that I know brings out a nice, friendly little child, okay? So I do that, and in the meantime, let's say everything's okay, and he's, he's, he's going back to the child, but I want to return him all the way to, I wouldn't touch him while he's got a, an assassin out, right? Okay. But... Let's say he's, he's, he's okay, but I want to speed up the process, so I do this. So it's a bilateral touch with the four fingers on both cheeks. And that's, that's a, a common return method. So um, just basically bilaterally tapping both cheeks on both sides. And that tends to return patients. Another one, but you need to be careful with it, is you've done a good job. Okay, this tends to return them, but some individuals will return in an angry state, especially if they're through enough therapy where they start to see, they, they know what this all means, and, and they're then beginning to associate you with their perpetrators. Um, three taps between the shoulder blades is another common one, one, two, three, although that sometimes can access other things. So uh, you need to be kind of be careful with that and, and, and so on. So these are a couple of um, fairly common access return methods. Let's see if there's anything else. Some people will do a thing where they um, touch the forehead coming down to the nose and say, tell, calling out a particular, like a, especially a child altar, to ask the child to picture the child, picture the self right there coming out and coming forward as you come down. Um, so those are a couple of methods. Um, so this is an important thing, especially with music. If you can, if you can learn how to access the host back, that's very, very helpful. Because you know, it's really, really frustrating and dangerous. Is when you, you you've been in therapy a long time, your other patient is waiting, and then this patient is you can't get them back in a safe state. And if you can learn how to do that quickly, it's like you can use your whole session just for therapy, and you don't have to spend like 30 minutes trying to get them back. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've never heard of that, but uh, again, there are, there are lots of different ways that people may respond. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Now the arm is a is a sensitive place to touch for programmed people. The forehead is another. Uh, some people respond to the heel of their foot. If if you have a person, for example, that's in a hospital and their their shoes are off, the heel of the foot sometimes. Now you can also input the program numbers there. Okay, on the shoulder, forehead, foot. Um, that's another way to to access. I don't do it very often because to me it feels like treating the person like a machine, and. Uh, to me, it's real important not to, I mean, because they're really not machines, but they've been told they were machines. So, um, but still, it is one way, if you need to get somebody back, let's say you know the host code is 321 is a common but not universal code for getting a host out, like in a countdown. Those, so occasionally you'll find someone that can come back to 321, or that is their programming code. And so, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 2, 1, will sometimes bring them back. The other thing is if you combine it with snaps, like 3, Two, one, and then if you add something like 
you're now fully awake, alert, and relaxed, and call out the name, uh, whatever. That, that'll tend to bring back a lot of people. Um, but again, not always. You have to try different things to find what works for that particular person best. Um, but the ability to return to the normal waking state is an important thing that we therapists need to do. Uh, and so that's a skill that's very important. Um, Okay, let's see how much time do we have? Ten minutes, okay. I'd like to go over a few... Um, expressions, verbal expressions. Some of them are expressions we want to avoid. And some of them are expressions that may be helpful. Here's one that often is problematic. Safe. Like I hear people say, you are safe here. Like a patient is going off in the hospital. And someone comes up and says, it's okay, you're safe here. It's okay, you're safe here. You're safe, you're safe, you're safe. And then the person's escalating. And then later you talk to the patient, they say that they were abused in a procedure where they were told that they were safe. Okay? Apparently that's fairly common because I hear it frequently from patients. Um, let's go through some other... If you look on your uh, outline on, where it says appendix... Um, it says, expressions associated with Christianity and other monotheisms. These are often provocative, you know, any kind of term, but many times, especially those tied in with um, uh, Gnosticism or Christian or Jewish mysticism may be significant. Uh, you'll notice that I have a, some association with Judaism and Kabbalah. Uh, it's not likely that these things will come up in conversation that you'll be discussing Tetragrammaton Elohim, but... Um, in some cases, you may be able to access uh, parts of them. And some of them, they don't respond specifically to that as an access, but they're so fascinated that you know the expression. And they'll come out and they'll say, where'd you hear about that? And sometimes they think it's a secret. They don't know it's written about in books. Um, Adonai, uh, a Hebrew word for the Lord, I believe is what that is. No, it's not? Okay, that's what I thought it was. Um, Shekinah, the... Uh, Kabbalistic woman god. She, pardon? Oh, you call it Shekinah. Okay, but it's considered a, a female aspect in the Kabbalah. Um, let's go back to the Christian term. Power. I had a patient uh, who came in very tranced out and she was listening to a preacher on TV talking about the power, the power, the power. And afterwards she was like this. Uh, the Lord's Prayer backwards, of course, is, is kind of a big thing for some folks, and, and the power and the glory. Um, and you can access, in a, in a benign way, people that way, too. You can. Uh, one of the things I used to do is ask people to imagine a um, power boat called Old Glory. The power boat, Old Glory. I say it over and over again, but it's a power boat, Old Glory. I'm not going to keep saying it for you, but I would for them and watch them go out. Now, why would anyone go out when you're talking about a boat? A power boat? Okay. It's called Old Glory. That's not unusual. I'm not calling it Dracula's Bride or anything. So, okay. What about Latin expressions that tie in with Catholicism, like mea culpa? Okay, some people will definitely respond to that. Uh, Christos and Christos, uh, Gnostic concepts about you know, who is the real Jesus and all that. You've probably heard this from the patient, so you know, uh, I'm sure. If, if not, I suggest you read about Gnosticism and some of the early theories about Christianity uh, and that kind of thing. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Good, good idea. Good idea. And that's how you desensitize that. Okay. Now here's a, a one that is not really a Christian expression, but it. one of my patients came in and said, I'm cured. Oh, she didn't say I'm cured. I'm well now. Cured is a, is a well and cured. Both can be triggers. Um, so I said, what happened? I, oh, I talked to my mom. Okay. Well, what happened? Well, we talked. You know, 
go on and on until finally you get to the, the... If you keep pressing, sometimes you get the answer. Well, she said, I am praying for your wellness and your complete recovery. And then, it's, I don't know, but I noticed after talking to her, my head was all clear. Well, this is an expression that tends to um, uh, affect people. Um, it tends to cause a shutdown state. Um, many patients, though, if you use this to help them shut down, they may have ulcers inside screaming because they perceive that they're tied up and in chains. So if you want to use it as a therapy technique, what I will do, for example, is already plant in their mind the idea of a hospital where the little ones can go and be safe, uh, avoiding the word safe, um, comfortable, and, and you, you help them build a mental image of this safe place, this okay place. And, uh, and then you tell them that as you talk, they're going to all go there. Well, you can add this in to give it power. And then uh, you can say, well, I want you to imagine you're watching TV and there's a preacher. Now, I, it would be inappropriate for me to say I'm praying for your wellness and complete recovery since I'm a secular therapist. But I could say, and you know, you can see yourselves watching TV and there's a preacher on TV and he says, yes, and bam, they're all there, just like that. And it's a strong binding so that they're, it's not easy for them to pop out again. Um, Today is your day to be healed. I had another patient that said she went to revival, and then she came to see me and said, um, "I'm all well. I'm, I'm integrated. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, tell me about it. You know. Well, I went to this revival, and um, so again, after a thousand questions, finally she told me that the preacher said something that she heard her father say. Well, what's that? She he said, uh, "Today is your day to be healed." And okay. Uh, well. I, I figured out that this was bogus, so uh, this she was not really integrated. So um, I signaled for one of the little ones to come out, and they did. She wasn't really integrated. And the little one told me the whole story, you know. And she also told me the way to get back in touch with the altars. You need to understand that some perpetrators will work to shut down the system so you can't talk to them. And if you know how to get around that, it helps a lot. Um, I'm praying for your wellness and your complete recovery. The way back to that, or from that, is uh, there is no power over those who are held captive. Now, some of these are real idiosyncratic and not everybody responds to them, but this one's fairly common where I've had a number of people from different parts of the country respond, so I don't think it's that idiosyncratic. Today is your day to be healed. The patient responded to that. Um, the return expression was um, reverse the curse. Whatever. Okay, we need to talk a little bit about expressions associated with demonology and archaic or oriental religions. Um, you see some of the words there. I'm not going to read them out to you. Um, this is how these were, act, were created and accessed. Um, let's, say, let's make up the name of a deity that's not been used. Um, is the word George okay with everybody? Okay. Um, Picture a group of people standing together in a circle and they're going, they're, they're chanting and they're going, George, chanting and George, chanting and George. And the drums are beating. And like here, it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay. Later, and someone's being hurt. Later, using that word will bring that one closer. And repeatedly, it'll bring it all, that one all the way out if they have someone by the name of George, let's say, the, the demon George. Uh, no offense if there are any Georges here. Oh yeah, let's jump to that. That's important. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to finish up here with the high points and I'm going to go right there. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, be careful about computer jargon. A lot of computer jargon causes reactions, expressions like online, offline. Ac here's one, access, identification, um, George. And you may get George. Or access, identification, code, George. Or what have you. Access, identification, Dr. Green. Access, identification, Dr. Blue, whatever. Um, stop, offline, access, enter, run. These are all things that can cause reactions. If you don't know what they are, you might check it out before you... Uh, trigger somebody. 
Uh, terms associated with fraternal organizations are common. Christian, Rosy Cross, Sorar, okay, Jabulon or Yabulon, you know, is the, is the, the word for Lucifer in uh, Masonese and Illuminatis. Is there another secret word for Lucifer beyond Yabulon, or is that the ultimate secret word? Or Jabulon? How do you say it? Yabulon? Is that the ultimate one, or is there a higher one? Okay. Um, obvious, obviously, if that's a secret thing to them, you, you, you can access certain feelings, memories, alters by using these secret things. Tubal Cain is another uh, dealie. Uh, anyway, total control, you will obey and come forth, brings them out. Uh, go to the pits of hell where you belong is a cult exorcism. Cults sometimes want to get rid of the alleged demons, and that's how they do it, I'm told, or at least some of them do. Um, disarm may cause a destructive one to go away for some individuals. Another one that causes destructive ways to go, ones to go away is shut down, shut down. Now you repeat it. Shut down, shut down. Sometimes that will cause them to... Uh, and then if it's not the right method, sometimes an altar will come out and tell you how to do it right. But once you show that you know some of the secrets, it's like it's okay. This guy already knows some of the secrets, so we can tell him some more. Um... Keep in touch. I had a patient that went out and burned herself after her, uh, or another relative told her to keep in touch after a family session. You are my pride and joy. Um, that's an access that goes with facial touching, uh, touching the uh, above the eyebrows, under the cheeks, and down from the ear to the chin simultaneously. So here, here, and here, like that. Sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about word matrices. Some of the accessing is done by serial, like serial programming where there's a series of stimuli, a series of alters or dissociated mental states that you're re receiving. Here I have a matrix. I'm not going to read it out, but you can see it where it says matrix A. It says one rearrangement of matrix A, and I forgot to rearrange it. Um, one rearrangement would go from started, if you, take a, if you have a pencil, and you draw a uh, pentagram from started down to the middle, down here, and then up again to xenophobe. And then you just go ahead and connect the rest so it makes a pentagram. So then it goes from xenophobe to throughout to forever. Let's see. need to look at my original. come back to this one. There is a sequence already set for the one in the back. Um, here. We have the matrix. This, one, this matrix is not, people don't respond to as commonly as the first one I showed you. But if you use these, for example, uncle, and uh, this is a common arrangement, not necessarily a universal one, but oftentimes if you present this to the patient, they'll show you the correct arrangement for them. And it, it, it's used for accessing particular alters that are important. So, for example, you can talk to the patient. You can say, um, I want you to imagine that y your uncle is coming to visit and uh, someone in the family is an alumna of the University of Texas and your aunt is uh, that person. And, of course, her husband is an alumnus and uh, because they like the University of Texas, they're from the University of Texas, um, they have a bull mounted on their car, etc. You know, you, you just use the words in the proper sequence. When you do that, 
uh, you tend to trance out the person. Now, you don't always have to use them in a specific sequence. Patients will often tell you that you do, but I find that people will trance out even if you don't. Um, now, let's see, I wanted to give you the sequence. I have a sequence, but it's not necessarily a universal one for that other combination. What it amounts to is drawing pentagrams that connect the, uh, let's see, let's see if I can get this. No, it has to include all the dots. Let's see. Um, uh, no. Okay, I don't believe I have the, uh, the specific one for that here, but um, what you'll find is different patients have a different sequence, and you can use them in the natural sequence, and then later they can, if they remember them, they can tell you uh, what it is, and um, they're supposed to be unique to the various individuals, they're not supposed to be completely general. Um, so um, it's okay just to, in fact, what I typically do is I don't say them to patients. When we're getting at this level of programming, if we're going to open it and talk about it, what I'll typically do is show it to the person and ask them if, they, if, if this means anything to them or if they recognize it. I'll ask them, is it safe to do this? This is another thing that's important. Whenever you're dealing with programming, is, without using the word safe, it's, it's, it's a good idea to talk to the person, is it okay and make sure that this is respectful, this is non-intrusive, and it's not something that they perceive to be dangerous. If you, if you go about it very carefully, you're not going to have any accidents. Okay? I have not had that happen using this kind of methodology. I've not had anybody get worse or react in a negative way. Okay? You're very careful. I think the crucial thing in therapy is really your relationship with the patient. It's not the mechanical things you do. And when they know that you're trying very sincerely and putting out great effort on their behalf, when you occasionally make a mistake, frequently they interpret it in that light and they don't interpret you saying take care of it as you must die. They're more likely to interpret what happens in a benign way. So you're more likely to get benign reactions. Um, I, have we run out of our time? Okay. I'm going to... Go ahead and close, but if, if anyone has questions, I will be around. I'll be happy to talk to you. And again, I thank you for your attention. And really, I want to encourage you to come tomorrow to our, our meeting for our society because we want to get together and, and do stuff. Thank you.